Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to switch topics a little bit today and go into real estate, which we've covered on this channel before, but I wanna delve into a very specific topic here and talk about the cap rate or capitalization rate. Once again, for all the files and resources here, you'll want to go to our page that details the cap rate. It's on our real estate modeling section under cap rate. I'll pin this URL under the video as the first comment so you can click on it and go to everything there. This is an excerpt from our real estate financial modeling course, which we recently spun off and separated from the REIT financial modeling course. So you can pick and choose and complete the course that is most useful to you. As always, I'm gonna start with a short version here, spend a few minutes on this, and then if you want more detail, you can keep watching and look at some of the more detailed examples after this. So the cap rate in real estate equals the projected stabilized net operating income of a commercial property divided by that property's value. It's the reciprocal of the EBITDA multiple for normal companies, which we've covered in this channel before. Net operating income itself is similar to EBITDA because it represents a property's cash flow from operations on a capital structure neutral basis before capital expenditures or the equivalent of capital expenditures for properties. At a basic level, net operating income or NOI is just revenue minus operating expenses and property taxes. The property value could be the asking price of the property, or it could be the actual price that was just paid for the property, or it could be the estimated market value of the property. So you have different ways to calculate the denominator here, but the numerator is usually more of a known quantity. The cap rate could be given as an assumption, or it could be up to you to make that assumption based on data that they provide. Now you might be wondering about why you use a cap rate rather than an EBITDA multiple. And I don't know if there's an official explanation, but the informal explanation is that a lot of investors think about real estate, especially stabilized properties with long-term contracts and reliable tenants as almost more of a fixed income or bond related investment. So the cap rate is framed as more of a yield metric, just like yields can be used to value bonds. This type of yield can be used to value properties. Ideally, you always want to use the forward or projected stabilized NOI to calculate the cap rate. So if the property's occupancy rate is currently 70%, but in the long term, it's expected to be 85%, you don't want to use a 70% rate. You want to use the 85% rate once the property stabilizes to calculate the NOI. And then, of course, you feed that NOI into the cap rate calculation. You don't care about the historical NOI. You don't care about capital costs such as capital expenditures for the building or tenant improvements or leasing commissions. You ignore debt service, depreciation, corporate level taxes. Only the property taxes paid to local regions factor in and are deducted to calculate NOI. So if we go to the very simple Excel example right here, we have our revenue, including base rental income, a couple other lines for absorption and turnover vacancy, expense reimbursements, concessions and free rent. We have a loss due to general vacancy because some of the buildings never occupied. And then we have all the property level expenses right here going down to the net operating income. Now, if we acquire the property at the end of year zero, we don't care about what happens in year zero. We care about what happens in year one, the first stabilized year, the forward projected stabilized year after the acquisition takes place. If the property acquisition value or the asking price is 25 million, let's say, then the cap rate here would be the NOI in this first year divided by the 25 million, which is about 7%. Now, if the asking price is much higher, let's say 40 million, now the cap rate is 4.4%. And so you can see that as the property's value or asking price moves up, the cap rate goes to a lower level. Now, if we were to think about this in terms of an EBITDA multiple instead, it would be one divided by this. So the reciprocal, which would come out to 22.9X, or if we go with that original assumption of 25 million, it would be around a 14 times EBITDA multiple. Notice how we are explicitly ignoring these CapEx line items below. We're also ignoring all the debt service, the interest expense and the principal repayments because the cap rate is solely based on the net operating income of the property. So that's the short version. Let's now go into some more detail on a few of these points. So I'll start with what affects cap rates and how you can find them. Then we'll talk about the cap rate versus the IRR versus the cash yield. We'll talk about how you use cap rates in real estate financial models, how they come up in REIT models, and then some variations, some controversies, and some trickier parts of the cap rate calculation. So this first part, what affects cap rates? The short answer is that it's pretty much the same factors that affect EBITDA multiples or any other valuation multiple for normal companies. So you have things like the growth potential, 
the overall risk, the desirability of the asset or company, and then some that are specific to real estate, such as location and the class of the property. Now, in a sense, these also apply to normal companies because a company could be in a more favorable geography or could operate in a more favorable region. It could have certain attributes that make it a higher class company than others. But I would say these are more specific to real estate for the most part. So if you know, for example, that an office building down the street sold for 6% cap rate, that doesn't necessarily mean anything because the building that you are analyzing could differ in many ways. For example, maybe one building is class A, but the other one is class B or class C. If that's the case, there's going to be quite a significant valuation difference between them. Maybe one building is located in a wealthy suburb, but another one is located in a downtown area that has recently experienced a zombie apocalypse and human civilization is barely functioning there. Obviously, in that extreme case, you're also going to see a huge valuation difference. And then there are other factors like the occupancy rate and the tenant quality. So it's the equivalent of looking at a company's customer base and how high quality they are. These tell you how stable the cash flows are. You want to look at things such as whether the tenants are large blue chip companies or startups or growth companies that have much less reliable cash flow and that may not even be in business within the next few years. So these are some of the factors that affect cap rates. Now, if you do a quick search online, all the major real estate brokerage firms such as CBRE here do cap rate surveys for different regions and they will show you what they have looked like overall historically going back 10 or 15 years. So you can find this data online pretty easily. It can be difficult to find very specific data such as cap rates on multifamily buildings or office buildings in New York or Chicago or something like that. But the data is out there. And especially if you have access to paid databases, you can usually find at least some numbers pretty easily. So the next point here is the difference between the cap rate and some other metrics like the internal rate of return and the cash yield. One issue with the cap rate is that it tends to overstate what you could earn on a property because it ignores debt service and capital costs. And these are both real cash costs that you have to pay if you buy a property and the debt service comes up if you ever use debt to buy a property and you're not just putting down 100% equity to buy it. So the cash yield, otherwise known as the cash flow to equity number, deducts both of these numbers, both of these cash outflows, and therefore gives you a more realistic estimate of what you might actually earn if you acquire a property using a combination of debt and equity. Now the IRR is the annualized return from buying a property, earning the cash flow to equity, and then selling it in the future. The cap rate acts as a key input to the IRR calculation, but it's not the same as the IRR because the cap rate is not an annualized figure. It measures just one year of performance and it doesn't give you the average return over a period as the IRR calculation does. So let's go back to our simple pro forma to illustrate some of these concepts. I'm going to delete some of the math here that I entered before. So if we go down and take a look at this, we have NOI, net operating income, and then adjusted net operating income down here. And then we have the cash flow to equity investors. The cash flow to equity investors gives us a much more accurate idea of what we might actually earn on this property because it deducts the capital expenditures and it also deducts the interest expense and the owed principal repayments on the debt that we use to purchase this property. And what we could do in this case is take this cash flow to equity number and then divide by the total amount of equity that we are contributing to buy this property and we get a number here of around 6.5%. And so that gives us a better idea of what type of yield we're actually getting on the money that we put in to acquire this property. If you go down and look at the IRR calculation here, the property acquisition price is based on a cap rate. And then the exit value at the end is also based on a cap rate. If you look at it, the exit price, we have an exit cap rate that we apply to the net operating income in the final stabilized year. We divide that by the exit cap rate and get to an exit price like that. So the cap rate is a key input into the IRR calculations, but it is different from the IRR itself. Now in real estate financial models, you can use cap rates in many ways. And I just showed you two of the methods for estimating the purchase price and the exit price, but you can also use it for a refinancing. Typically when a loan refinancing takes place, the new loan amount is based on a loan to value or LTV ratio, such as 60 or 70% of the property's value. And when you look at something like this, I'm bringing up an example here for a hotel renovation. When a refinancing takes place, if we have a 75% LTV ratio, we value the property on this refinancing date based on a cap rate. I'll go down here and show you the set. 
These are cap rates for a hotel in Australia, so they are higher than what you would typically see for a multifamily property or an industrial building, for example. But we use these and the forward NOI to value this particular hotel. And then we base the amount of new debt the property can use on the property value times the 75% LTV ratio. You can also use cap rates just in general valuation of property. So if you build a DCF for a property, the terminal value is often linked to an exit or terminal cap rate. If the property stays the same over the holding period or it only changes very slightly, you probably want to assume that the cap rate increases over time, meaning a lower valuation because the property is older and less appealing at the end of the period. So if the going in cap rate is something like 7% as it is for this stabilized property, then at the end of the period, you probably actually want to have a higher cap rate. It's quite weird here that we have a lower cap rate because it's a stabilized property and it doesn't appear to change much. So we would immediately question this assumption and ask why the cap rate doesn't go up to 7% or 8% or something like that. Now, if there are major renovations or the market changes in a major way, you could make the case for a cap rate decrease, meaning that the valuation of the property goes up over time. But this depends very heavily on just how significant these changes and renovations are. In REIT financial models, you also use cap rates because real estate investment trusts are constantly buying, selling, developing, and renovating properties. And so you need to make a cap rate assumption for each business activity or each geographic segment to figure out the REIT's revenue and expenses. For example, if the REIT says that we'll spend $500 million on acquisitions in the next year and the average cap rate is 7%, that will add $35 million to the REIT's net operating income for the period. And Technically, it'll be less than this because this is based on what happens in the next year if you're using the correct value for cap rate, but I think you get the idea. This means that at some point in the future, the REIT will get an additional $35 million in net operating income. It'll be lower if you look at it in terms of operating income or EBITDA due to corporate overhead, but it will add something in that range to the REIT's overall business operations. I want to conclude with a few variations of the cap rate and some trickier things to think about with this. When you're working with European real estate and some European REITs, some cities will use gross yields or net yields or just plain yields instead of the cap rate. And the basic difference is that these metrics tend to be based on the rental income rather than the net operating income. Also the net yield versus the gross yield, the net yield subtracts certain expenses that the owners or the sponsor of the property has to pay and that they cannot actually pass through directly to the tenant. Now, these types of yield metrics are the most common when you are dealing with triple net leases where the tenants are indeed responsible for most of or all of the expenses. It doesn't really make sense to use them if the tenants aren't paying much and it's really up to the owner of the property to pay for most of the expenses. So for example, I have this IFRS based valuation for this one REIT that operates in several cities in Spain and France. And if you look at the assumptions, in a city like Barcelona, they're using the gross yield to value properties and to determine the NOI impact from acquisitions and developments there. And then Madrid, they're also using the gross yield. But then in Paris, they actually use the net yield. So it's just a geographic difference and it's something to be aware of that you will see these variations. If you look at what the net yield here is linking to, we use it to actually value the asset in this case. So we take the net rental income in the next period, we divide by this net yield and get the asset valuation like that. Now you can use any of these, but you just have to be consistent with your calculations and with the ones that you're using to make sure you don't get mismatched numbers. There are also a lot of inconsistencies with the exact items that go into net operating income, even if you're dealing with just US-based properties. The classic example here is if you look at a real estate pro forma, Usually there is some type of line item for the reserves that are being set aside for future capital costs, such as replacing equipment or improving a space for a tenant or paying a leasing commission to win a new tenant. If you anticipate those types of cash outflows coming up, the property will typically set aside something for them. Now, some people will look at this and say that these should be excluded from net operating income. Others say they should be deducted because you do want to reflect at least some of those upcoming future cash outflows. So you will see different treatments of this type of line item. And again, it's not that one is right or one is wrong. You just have to be consistent. So if you deduct these line items, fine, but you have to do that everywhere. And the same goes for any type of historical data that you're looking at. 
Some regions also just don't have much data on cap rates. And in that case, you might have to rely more on other valuation methodologies, such as the DCF to value properties. The most important thing with all these points is that you have to be consistent with your treatment. You can make almost anything work in a model or analysis, but you can't keep switching between different types of cap rates or yields or numbers that are calculated on a slightly different basis. So let's do a quick recap and summary now. What affects cap rates and how to find them? You look at things like the property's location, the class, the growth potential, the overall risk, the occupancy rate, the tenants. You can find data on a lot of real estate brokerage sites, although sometimes you may not have much luck finding very specific data, such as cap rates for one property type in one city, for example. The cap rate versus the IRR versus the cash yield. The cash yield is more like the cash flow to equity divided by the equity contributed in the beginning. The cap rate is the NOI divided by the property's value. And the cash yield gives you a better idea of what you can actually expect to earn after the debt service and the capital costs. The IRR is different from both of these because this is more of an annualized metric that gives you the average annualized return over the holding period. Use cap rates in real estate models for the purchase price, the exit price, refinancing, and also generally for valuing properties. In REIT models, you use them to project the additional NOI that might come from acquisitions and developments and redevelopments and other activities like that. And then there are some variations of the cap rates, such as the gross yield and net yield in many European countries. Some people calculate NOI and cap rates differently, especially when it comes to items like the reserves and the allocation to reserves for capital costs. So you just have to be aware of these issues and be careful with the data that you're using to make sure it's consistent. That's about it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this concept of cap rates, how to use them, and some pitfalls to watch out for in real estate financial modeling.